Hi. <laughs> yeah, me. Georgia May Mossholder. Do I have my hat on? Um, we are in the Canadian West Collection book, Wind Breaks the Dawn, and we are up to chapter 27, which is titled, Out. Out. The two trappers who had picked up the stolen furs had brought them into Ian's trading post and Wynne oversaw the sorting of whose furs were whose. I couldn't see how the men could tell one from fur from another and asked Wynne about it. Oh, they know their own furs all right, no problem there, said Wynne. Little marks or nicks or coloring, they can identify them all. The furs of the dead trappers were traded in at the post for the families of the men. Wynne told me that Ian had given them more than a fair price. All the village men returned from their trap lines, and, and then I knew that spring really had returned. We finished up our classes, and I started to work on my garden. I was glad to have my hands back in the soil and, and to watch things begin to grow. A few of the other women in the village had seen the advantages of a garden, and Nimi and I had been happy to help them get their own started. I was just settling in to another quiet summer day when Wynne came back to the house. Are you all packed? He grinned, and I looked at him questioningly. I knew Wynne was still trying to find a way for me to travel out of Edmonton and then to Calgary. For several reasons, I was anxious and chafing to go, and yet at his words now, a strange little reluctance raised its head. What do you mean? I asked him. I've heard of a party going out, so I sent a runner to ask them if they could drop by this way. I didn't say anything. If they come, they should be here sometime tomorrow. I expect that they will spend the night here and then move on early Thursday morning, continued Wynne. Thursday morning. Excitement and doubt filled me at the same time. Could I really leave Wynne for several weeks with no means of communication between us? Wynne pulled me close. I'm going to miss you, Elizabeth, he said taking for granted that I would be going. I sniffed. Who is it? I asked, almost hoping it would be someone who I could refuse to travel with. A couple from the force. I didn't discover their names. Members of the force? Well, I could hardly refuse to go with them if they would have me. Are you sure they'll be willing to take along a woman? Oh, I think they will. Most of us try hard to accommodate one another. We need to help each other out in any way we can. I'll send along a small tent for your, for your use. They won't mind setting it up for you. I sighed. Then I guess I better get ready, I said reluctantly. Oh, I guess you had, replied Wynne, and he kissed me on the nose and then went back to his work. I was suddenly in a frenzy. I, I hauled out my wardrobe and realized I didn't have a decent thing to wear. Whatever would I do? I had no time to make anything and no material to do so, even if there had been the time. I hope no one sees me before I have a chance to get to a store and make some purchases. I thought frantically. Yet I wasn't as concerned about my own preparations as I was about when. I did his laundry, although I had done it all just a few days before. I baked some fresh bread and some cookies and a cake. I made up some stew and sealed it in jars so that he could heat it as needed. In a fever pitch, I worked all afternoon and the next day, until in the afternoon, I heard the sound of many barking dogs in the village. 
I rushed to the window and looked down toward the settlement and found that the visitors had come. The men traveled in a wagon with a pair of tired-looking horses, thin and ill-kempt from the long winter. I could see, even from my vantage point, that they wore the stripes of the Mounties. I saw Ian's hands raise and point in the direction of our cabin. And then the wagon rolled on toward me. I had no hay to offer them for their horses, but told them they were welcome to let them graze on the tall grass out back of our cabin, provided they kept them well away from my garden. The shorter one grinned at my comment and went to care for the horses. I invited them in to have a cup of coffee and some fresh bread, and they seemed to like the idea. They were still at the table when Wynn came in. He had hurried, he had heard they had arrived and hurried home to have a chance to visit with him and to catch up on any pertinent news. So, what takes you out? he asked them. New orders? No, said the taller one, known as Hank Lovis. The war. Oh, they haven't settled it then? was Wynne's response. I was hoping by now it would be over and done with. Oh, I guess that's what we'd all hoped, but I'm afraid it ain't so, said the shorter one, Ted James. From the reports we've been getting, it might be lasting a while yet. So you're joining up? We're well, going to do what we can, said James. Again, I thought of Matthew. If this horrid war continued, would he go? A chill gripped my heart. The men talked on, but I went outside to the clothesline to get Wen's things so that I could iron them. I didn't want to hear about the war anyway. Wen took the two men for a tour around the village while I prepared supper. I was relieved to have them out from underfoot. And then I remembered that I would be underfoot for them for the next several days. I wondered how they felt about that. Just as Wynne had supposed, the men stayed overnight. They declined our offer to sleep on the floor in the cabin and spread their bedrolls out under the tall pine trees. Perhaps they knew Wynne and I needed this time alone. There was so much to say to one another and and yet words were so inadequate. We talked on until late into the night, yet I can't remember one thing of importance that was said. Men came, morning came all too early. The men were anxious to get on the way, and I was determined not to be any more of a nuisance than was necessary. Wynn held me for a long time before we went to join the men, yet it wasn't nearly long enough. When will I see him again? My heart wailed as my eyes searched his face one last time. He was sending a letter to headquarters asking that when members of the force next traveled back our way, I would be contacted and given an opportunity to travel with them. That might be in a few days' time or several months. I did not know. The trip out was not too difficult, probably because I was better prepared and knew what to expect. I was busy counting off the days until we would be in Edmonton. The men were not talkative. They did not even converse with one another. I guess they were both used to silence. I tried to help out where I could, but even the cooking they did better than I, being more used to the trail and open fires. The nearer we got to Edmonton, the more my blood began to race. I was going out. How different would the world be from the one that I had left behind? How much change would there be in my family? How much change will they see in me? I wondered as I looked down at my faded, patched dress and rough hands. 
When we reached Edmonton, the men, men arranged for my stay in a hotel, purchased my train ticket to Calgary, and told me how and when to be at the train the next morning. I thanked them for their kindness, and then with a lump in my throat, I wished them well in the war they were going to fight on behalf of myself and the rest of Canada. They had been good to me, these young gentlemen. They had not fussed nor pampered me, but they had been kind and patient. I assured them that my prayers would follow them. I was on my own then, on my own, in a big city. I wonder if I still know how to act. I asked for help from the man behind the desk and set out, embarrassed about my attire, to find the nearest dress shop. After doing enough shopping to at least get me to Calgary in a somewhat presentable state, I went back to my room. Ah, oh, what plush accommodations! I exulted. A soft carpet covered the floor and like lacy curtains overhung by thick draperies graced the window. The room was as large as our kitchen living quarters and then some. I hardly knew what to do with all that room to myself. I went into the bathroom and gazed, gasped in amazement at what at one time I had taken simply for granted. It had been years since I'd seen such luxury. I crossed to the tub, my, my fingers caressing the smooth white surface. The towels were so soft, they felt like Kip's thick fur. And the room smelled as fresh as a pine forest. I ran the water, pouring in a generous supply of bubbly soap, and then submerged myself in the warm, soapy water it felt so good. I stretched out lazily. What a treat to get all of me in the tub at the same time. I don't, I don't know how long I spent in the tub. I only know that by the time I reluctantly crawled from it, my fingers were all wrinkled and the water was quite cold. I wrapped myself in my worn old robe thinking ahead to the soft, fluffy one I had left behind at Mary's. It would be good to see my fashionable clothes again. The soft things, the dainty things, the pretty colors, the frills and foibles. I could hardly wait. I had missed them. I dressed in my simple new gown. It really was quite becoming. I carefully did my hair up in a way I hadn't combed it for ages. When I was done, I surveyed myself in the mirror and was pleasantly surprised at how good I looked. But then I looked down at my hands and saw the stains and calluses from working in the garden, peeling vegetables, washing clothes on the scrub board, and I hid my hands behind me. I was no longer the cared-for and manicured girl who had left Calgary for the wilderness a few years earlier. I hoped no one would look at my hands. And then I noticed my arms. They had a number of telltale little welts on them, each indicating a spot where a mosquito or black fly had visited me. I knew my face and neck bore the same spots, and my confidence began to quickly wane. Then I straightened up to my full height, reminding myself that I wasn't out to set the fashion world to buzzing. I was here to see my doctor, to get some answers, to get some help. And just as quickly as possible, I would be rejoining my husband in the north where I belonged. With those thoughts to bolster my courage, I, I left my room and went down to the front desk to ask the attendant where I might find the dining room. Chapter 28 Calgary The next morning as the train left the Edmonton Depot bound for Calgary, I was almost giddy with excitement. I would soon be seeing my family again. 
I would be back to the city life I had once known. And more importantly, I hoped to get some help from my doctor. The train had not changed. It was still ponderously slow and stopped at every little siding to waste some more precious time. I could hardly bear the agony of it all. At long last, we came to Lacombe, and I strained to see if I could catch a glimpse of faces that I might know. Though the streets of the little town were busy, I, I did not see anyone whom I had known while a teacher there. At long last, we were on our way again, chugging south, the tracks clicking as we made our slow progress. Again, it was stop and go, stop and go. The sun swung around toward the west, hot as it came in the window. I wished for a seat on the other side of the aisle, but the train was filled with passengers. I shifted farther away from the window and tried to keep from looking out to determine just how far along the tracks we were. It was no use. I was soon crowding the window again, straining to see out and to guess the distance left to Calgary. We finally reached the city and I held my ex excitement at bay while the train pulled into the depot and with a giant sigh, shuddered to a halt. I remembered well the first time I had entered Calgary. The city had changed much since then, but I had changed even more. The young stylish school teacher from the East no longer existed. In her place was an older, wiser, and I hoped more sensitive woman. John's entire family was there to meet me. I had called them from the Edmonton Hotel the evening before, telling them I would be arriving by train. They were almost as excited as I was. How the children had grown! I couldn't believe how tall William was and how mature looking for a mere boy. He was a teenager now and hoped everyone would realize it. Sarah, too, had shot up and looked like a young lady rather than a child. She was eleven and carried herself with an air of grace. But I suppose that it was Kathleen who had changed the most. From the dear little child of four who had met me at the station and become my constant companion, she was now a young, nine-year-old girl, poised and proper. I fell in love with her all over again, though I found it difficult not to wish the little girl back again. Baby Elizabeth, who had been only a few months old when I arrived in Calgary, the summer of 1910, was now ready to start school in the fall. Mary had the same bright smile, the same beautiful reddish hair, the same flashing eyes I remembered so well. John had not changed much either, although I noticed a few white hairs in his carefully trimmed sideburns. I looked around for Julie. I guess Mary could read my mind. Julie is out of town. Her husband is taking some services as at Lethbridge, and Julie went with him. We phoned her last night, and she was so excited she could hardly stand it. She was going to hop the train and come right on up. But he will be finished tomorrow, and then they will both be home. I understood, but it would be hard to wait. I hadn't remembered that John and Mary's beautiful home was so big, nor so lovely. I wandered around, rubbing, running my hand affectionately over furniture and fancies. I had almost forgotten that such things made up a house, at least some of them. Dinner was delicious. We had dishes that I had not tasted for years. Wonderful Stacy had prepared all my favorite things. Stuffed chicken breasts, whipped potatoes, creamed broccoli, corn on the cob, and for dessert, her famous chocolate mousse. 
I ate until I, I ate it till I felt ashamed of myself. All the time I was enjoying Mary's home and Stacy's dinner, I thought of Win. If only he were with me, this would be sheer heaven. But Win was far away in his Northland. A little ache tugged at my heart. Back in my old room, and after soaking in a luxurious bath, I reclaimed one of my lacy silk nightgowns. Feeling much the pampered lady, I climbed into bed, smiling to myself in the darkness. The bed was so soft and smelled so good that I had visions of the best sleep I'd had for years. But it didn't work that way. i have become used to a harder mattress. I tossed and turned, but sleep did not come. Around three o'clock, in desperation, I threw my pillow on the carpeted floor, took a blanket with me, and lay down to sleep. I felt foolish curled up on the carpet and fervently hoped I would waken in the morning before I was discovered. I was soon asleep. The next day was busy. I got out all my store dresses and admired their beauty as I pressed them ready for use. I had forgotten I had so many pretty things. Well, I did need to do some shopping, however, so in the afternoon I took the streetcar downtown. I had felt sophisticated and proper when I left Mary's house, but I hadn't been on the streets for long until I realized that my beautiful gowns were now dreadfully out of style. The farther I went, the more evident it became. Well, I certainly didn't have the funds for a complete new wardrobe. Yet it was plain to see that the dresses of today were far different from mine. I stood out on the street as one who had been clothed from missionary barrels supplied by the castoffs of the rich. In embarrassment, I headed home. I was hardly in the door when I told Mary. My dresses are dreadfully out of date. What will I do? I had no idea that the styles had changed so much. Then I looked more carefully at Mary. If I had been observant, I would have noticed yesterday that she too dressed in the newer fashions. Oh my, said Mary, noticing my discomfiture. I should have thought to tell you, Elizabeth. But you always had such pretty things. Well, they might be pretty, but they definitely aren't in vogue. I don't want to buy a new wardrobe for the few days I will be in the city. And I don't have the money for that, even if I did wish to. But I will need something else. Most of the dresses on the street were much shorter and not as frilly. More, more tailored looking. And my hat. It was all wrong, too. Why don't we see what we can do, offered Mary. If you don't mind them being cut, I'm sure we can find ways to change your dresses and make them quite acceptable. Well, they're no good to me as they are. If you can fix them, even two or three of them, I can make do. We chose three dresses that seemed to lend themselves to change, and then dear Mary set out to alter them. Oh, they turned out quite well, and I felt that now I could walk the city streets without too much embarrassment. John and Mary added a little surprise. They asked me if they could take me shopping for a new suit and hat, with shoes and bag to match. I hesitated at first, but when Mary expressed her love and deep desire to do this, I consented and gave them both a big hug. Julie finally arrived, running quickly up the front walk. She was bubbly. She was beautiful. She was in love. And she was noticeably pregnant. My breath caught in a little gasp. I wouldn't let Mary tell you, she enthused. I just had to tell you myself. Oh, Beth, I never knew just how happy one could be. I hugged her close. I was happy for her, too, and no one there knew that the tears on my cheeks were 
were more than just shared joy for Julie. We had a lot of catching up to do. Her eyes shining with love, she proudly introduced her young husband. I remembered that Julie had once swooned over Wynne and had asked me if the forest had any more like him. Well, Reverend Thomas Conway was not another Wynne. He was much shorter and slender in build. He had rust-colored hair with, with a carefully trimmed little mustache to match. He had laughing deep blue eyes and a kind smile. He looked like just what Julie needed, and I liked him immediately. Julie insisted on sharing her wardrobe for the time I would be in Calgary and brought over three dresses that fit me just fine. Actually, she couldn't wear these particular ones in her condition anyway, she assured me. With six dresses, a suit, and proper shoes, hat, and bag, I felt quite confident to face the world. I smiled to myself as I hung up the garments. Imagine the Beth of old wearing hand-me-downs, made-overs, and garments of charity. We called Toronto on John's telephone and I had a long talk with mother and dad, their voices bringing back so many memories. They were alone now, with the older girls married and scattered, me up north, Julie out west, and, as I had feared, Matthew gone to war. There were just the two of them. Mother was worried about Matthew, and I'm afraid I was no comfort to her. I was worried about him, too. I thought about this young brother, a man now, who wished to serve his country. And a little prayer went up even as my chest constricted. Why did he have to go? I asked myself. But I knew. He went for the same reason so many other young men were going. Their country needed them. After the first few days of flurry and bustle had passed, I decided I was now ready to phone the doctor and make my appointment. Mary immediately became concerned when I told her that my real reason for making the trip was to consult a doctor. But when I hastened to explain that no, I had not been ill, not more than an occasional cold or flu the entire time I had been in the north, she relaxed. I was having a checkup at my husband's request, I informed her, and she agreed that it was a good idea and when was right to desire it. The doctor's visits and tests were soon behind me, and the day, day came for my final consultation. With anticipation and fear, I went to see him. He was a balding, elderly man, his understanding eyes almost hidden behind bushy eyebrows and dark-rimmed glasses. He motioned for me to be seated and cleared his throat. I nervously twisted the handkerchief I carried, my eyes studying his face for some clue. I wanted so much to hear good news. Well, Mrs. Delaney, he said, clearing his throat again, all the tests are in now, and he hesitated for what seemed like forever, and then went on. I find no reason for you to not conceive. I exhaled and let my body relax. Oh, that's good news, I said in almost a whisper. The doctor looked over the glasses. Well, that depends on how you look at it, he said. If you don't find a problem, then we cannot do anything to correct it. He cleared his throat again. He waited for my reaction, wondering if I had understood what he had just said. I understood what he was saying. There is nothing he can do for me. I might as well not have come. It really made no difference. No difference at all. The good doctor continued talking, explaining things I did not understand 
But then I was not really listening. I had already heard all I needed to know. Now I just wanted to get out of his office. I went for a long walk before catching the streetcar home. I don't really know where I went. I just walked, not paying much attention to where I was going or what was around me. I came to the river and as I stood gazing down on it, my mind began to clear of its fog. Perhaps the river reminded me of the wilderness. It was the only thing in the city that looked like home. I lowered myself to the grassy bank in the shade of the poplar trees and let the tears flow. I wanted win. With all my heart, I wanted win. No one else really understood how I felt. I cried for quite a while before I got myself in hand and then I blew my nose dipped cool water for my face and went in search of a streetcar. Mary and I had a long talk that night. I told her all about my problem, my aches and my longing. She understood as well as another could understand. She promised that she too would pray that my desire would be granted. I appreciated her love and understanding and encouragement, but I still felt empty. Besides, I, I felt threatened by this strange world I had come back to. All the talk of the war, the daily news of more conflicts, the list of those killed or missing in action filled the papers and caused an atmosphere of constant fear. I didn't feel comfortable with this new world. My northern isolation had protected me from all this. I got in touch with headquarters for any information on when I might be able to return to the north. The man with the deep bass voice told me that there was nothing he knew of in the immediate future, but that he had my number and strict orders to contact me as soon as something came up. I thanked him and hung up the phone. I did pray with all my heart that it would be soon. Oh, and it won't be long because chapter 29 says home again. <laughs> so I will be back with chapter 29. I have to look one more thing. Hold on just a second. There are 33 chapters. So we're on 29. So we're close to being done with this book. And then it goes to When Hope Springs New. Okay, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry to digress, but I will be back with Chapter 29 called Home Again. That'll be good. Home. <laughs>